Welcome to the Harp Bioherbicide Podcast. I'm Dr. Alex Danis, and for today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Mike Cockrell, the Senior Advisor in Supply Chain for Harp Bioherbicide. Originally from the Washington, D.C. area, Mike has had an accomplished 39-year career with experience in engineering, technology, plant management, manufacturing, and supply chain roles. We spoke about the supply chain challenges facing all areas of the agriculture and manufacturing sectors, and the specific challenges and opportunities when it comes to biologicals like HARP. First question uh, should be hopefully a pretty easy one. Can you introduce yourself? Tell me who you are and what you do. Good. Okay. So my name is Mike Cockrell. Uh, I have been with HARP now for two years. Uh, professionally and by by degree, I'm a chemical engineer. And my uh, responsibilities at HARP uh, involve the development of, of the supply chain concept for the for the future launch of, of HARP. So when we think about supply chain, uh, I like to uh, break that into four buckets. So we typically refer to it as plan, source, make, and deliver. Uh, so we talk about planning. Uh, you know, we're looking at the long-term projections for HARP, uh, sales, uh, netted demands of active ingredient uh, by type. As you know, we're working both with a, a natural plant-based uh, oil as one, and then we're, we're working with uh, its nature identical version version where we chemically synthesize uh, the, these active compounds. So what are the demands? So sourcing involves uh, developing a supply base uh, to produce and deliver these actives, um, qualifying them, uh, looking at suppliers that have a certain geographic diversity, technical diversity uh, to meet the needs of HARP, uh, working with them on certain aspects of, of quality quality versus cost trade-offs um, and, and, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, then we talk about manufacturing and here we get into the realm of, of the active ingredient manufacturing technology itself. Uh, there's actually different ways to, to make uh, these, these nature identical compounds. Um, so which, which process is, is best for heart? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we want more than one one process. Where is it made? How is it made? Um, along the along the supply chain, and then finally you get to deliver, and that's that's more or less for later post commercialization. But that's the distribution, transportation, and and customer service uh, thereof, and that that will come in time. So that's that's it in a nutshell. I mean, that's a large nutshell, though. There's so many different parts of this that have to all come together to go from actually planning, finding, getting these ingredients, turning them into harp, and then getting them to people. This is a complicated process that you are sort of planning out here. It It, it is. It is. And it and it, it, it can be. But, uh, you know, we're working with uh, uh, a really uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have a, a, an excellent base of, of potential suppliers out there that we're working with and learning from and spending a lot of time with the last couple of years. And uh, so we're, we're sorting it out. Um, we have, the good thing is we have uh, a lot of options for supply, uh, both of the natural plant extract oils. And here we speak largely about mint oil as one of the, one of the, the, uh, uh, the dominant, you know, species, if you will. Um, and then along the, the chemical chain for Nature Identical, um, we have some very large, uh, uh, technically capable suppliers, geographically diverse multinationals uh, that bring a lot of technology and, and know-how. So they're, uh, they're all eager and jumping in to help HARP. They're uh, uh, excited about the opportunity, um, what it could mean for, for their business, uh, because it's an opportunity to open up new, new markets, new end uses for for their uh, portfolio of products, so they're they're excited, and uh, you know we 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 have a lot of uh, possibilities with them as we go forward. We just have to sort it out and and see what's best for Harp. I'd actually I'd really love to sort of dig into both of those and maybe start with the the mint oils, the sort of natural path, because I know that you're speaking with people around the globe, right? Some people here in the U.S. and that also is Correct. geographically diverse, and people over in India. What does Correct. that look like in figuring out, you know, 
how do you choose where you're going to get these oils from and likely more than just one, right? How do you figure out the right composition of, you know, what percentage is coming from these different areas, sort of what qualities are coming from different places? How do you handle first on that sort of naturally derived side, right. this problem? How do you deal with that? Well, you mentioned geographic uh, diversity, and that's uh, in the end game, that's going to be very important. Um, you know, if you look at today, uh, India produces uh, most of, of, of natural, you know, mint oil extract today. Um, but the U.S. has a, a, a significant role and it's it, there has a history of production really all over the world, almost every continent. Uh, uh, China has been a, a large producer in the past, Brazil. Um, so, you know, this this is going to be very important as we look to expand uh, production over time. Um, uh, we we want to be able to produce men on on multiple continents for for that reason of diversity, supply availability, uh, climate variation, all, all those types of things. So the U.S. has uh, probably uh, some of the, the best research around mint, especially when we talk about uh, uh, yields and, and that type of thing, because we're we're anxious to push the yield curve on on the crop. Um, we're not so much interested in the uh, what, what what they call organoleptic properties of mint, so how it smells, how it tastes, uh, maybe the cooling sensation in the mouth. All that's important to personal care products and and pharmaceuticals and, and flavorants. But uh, we're we're anxious to to push yield, and that's not something that's been uh, let's say overly explored before because mm-hmm. it's all been around the. These higher quality aspects uh, important to the consumer. So, a uh, new area of, of, of research potentially. Um, we've talked to you know people that are, have developed you know different mint uh, species, and and so that's what we're looking at. But geographic diversity is going to be key. Um, you know, uh, ideally, in in the active ingredient manufacturing world, you can uh, s- source and and formulate your products locally. So, let's say you know mint uh, from Asia. If you can, can generate, you know, the the uh, the active ingredient supply there, uh, formulate locally in the region, you know, that that sets up well for supply chain in terms of inventory management, in terms of costs and logistics. Uh, the same for for North America. So this is again part of the, the puzzle. But uh, the the great thing is we you have a, a supply base that is um, uh, a- anxious to uh, increase capacity. The the mint uh, industry in general has uh, has suffered a little bit the last few years, especially in India. Um, pandemic was one thing, but all, also, you know, just economics and, and honestly pressure from the uh, chemical lookalikes. So the synthetics or these nature identicals that have uh, made headways uh, into the market the last uh, three to five years. Uh, so, you know, a lot of mint producers around the world are looking for uh, support. Um, someone said we're looking for a savior. And, um, and there's a, a fair amount of capacity and infrastructure out there that already, you know, waiting for HARP to uh, to take advantage of and work with these suppliers. Um, and not to mention, it's such a wonderful sustainability story when it comes to uh, production in India. You know, there's some estimated 2 million smallholder farmers that have a, have a stake in mint. It's one of the rotational crops. And um, so any, uh, they are looking for assistance and, and opportunity. And so I think, you know, the timing is right and things will, will come together in that in that aspect of the supply chain. When we think about, too, the people who are making these sort of lookalike molecules, these sort of synthetic, you know, natural similars, what are you looking for in those kinds of things? You know, again, geographic diversity is going to be important. So you can create these sort of local systems of producing, formulating and getting out all in one area. But what else are you looking for from them? You know, it's not going to be the same thing as yield and growing a crop. What's the sort of yield similarity that you're looking for from those different producers? Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're looking... Uh, to, to help us, their expertise um, in, in producing these, uh, these nature identical compounds. You know, there's a handful that, that are very interesting to, to HARP that, that exhibit this, uh, this, this natural uh, bioherbicide tendency. Um, they have a lot of expertise. Uh, some of these compounds have been produced uh, for as long as 70 years. So there's been a lot of investment, a lot of R&D on behalf of these major uh, companies, a lot of know-how. Uh, and R&D is still ongoing after after 70 years because, you know, the markets are important to them. 
And uh, again, HARP represents an opportunity to them to, to expand, to, to dilute, dilute their cost base, et cetera. So we're looking, looking for their know-how. Um, they all offer uh, unique and different uh, chemical routes to, to produce these nature identical compounds, and that's important. Uh, some are more cost effective than others. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is at these companies. We know that you know where we uh, exactly start with the chemistry isn't necessarily where we'll end over time as we talk about life cycle management, uh, especially of a new a new discovery, a new active ingredient compound. And we're we're already thinking about the next generation of chemistry and and, and analogs to where we start, and we're already having those discussions with these suppliers about their uh, capabilities and, and interest to to develop that. So we're looking for companies, uh, supply partners that can can move with us, that can develop with us, that can lifecycle manage and and drive that cost experience curve down over time, which is. Which is, is which is key to the you know to the long term success of, of any any new new active ingredient compound. So that adaptability then is something that you're looking for that ability it, it, to sort of grow exactly. with the product. Exactly. And when you're yeah, thinking- the interesting thing is you know, we like about that is we can uh, you know there there are different uh, supply routes so. We, we wouldn't necessarily always be bound to a single raw material. So if, if we were, you know, got in a problem uh, of supplier availability or disruption of, uh, let's say, a, a petroleum de- derivative that could really disrupt the supply chain, um, that's that's not necessarily the case. There's there's different routes, um, and and that bodes well for for flexibility and and sort of resiliency in, in the future supply chain. So. When you're thinking about planning out the supply chain, because HARP is not, uh, the goal is not to be sort of the ultimate producer, right? The goal is to create this incredible product and hand it over to somebody else who can sort of take over that supply chain. So you're sort of creating this future look, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're creating this sort of future looking plan that you can sort of present to somebody and be like, we've figured it all out for you. Here's how you can go from the raw materials to the product. And like, we've solved all these problems for you. What's the hardest part of that? What's the, what's the sort of space you got to put yourself into to be like, I'm solving problems that are 10 years down the road before they've happened. Right. Well, and, and that's that's important. That will be important to uh, uh, any you know, a future acquirer of Harp, let's say. Um, and and really, uh, we're just trying to anticipate what what you know a, a company, a major company, would be be looking for. And, and I'm using my past experience, 38 years of industry experience, with uh, uh, seen it all, trials and tribulations and supply chains. So I sort of know what what makes for a good. Uh, re- resilient, redundant supply chain. So that's what that's what we're trying to develop. Um, Harp is very fortunate in, in in a sense that the the active ingredients, these compounds, are are existing today, either in large supply or, or in small supply that can be uh, developed, you know, over time. And um, so that's 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 what we're trying to um, um, you know. Deliver uh, to to uh, you know a future acquire. Um, show them the, the the path forward. How how do we you know build out capacity? There's there's a fair amount of capacity out there to to launch HARP. That's not a problem. But we're trying to identify the inflection points of when we would have to expand. You know based on on future demands when we would have to expand and invest. But we have a supply base that's uh, either already doing that or willing to do that in the future. So the great thing here is that the, uh, a, a, an acquirer would not have to uh, sink a lot of capital into the active ingredient manufacturing side. It's more they can uh, work with this, a very capable supply base if, if they choose to. I mean, you can always go your own way. Uh, you know, these would be large, capable companies uh, capable of building their own. But, but in this case, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to, uh, to, to work with, with what's out there. Um, I think that'll be more cost effective. And in and and less capital intensive, obviously, and it gives the companies an opportunity to deploy that those resources, capital resources elsewhere, to focus on the development, the the, the build out of the registrations, uh, the commercial launches, uh, the lifecycle management of the product. You know, and so you don't have to have that double jeopardy of 
building a massive active ingredient facility on one hand and, and, and also the burden of, of, and costs of, of launching a product on a worldwide scale. So that's the, that's the opportunity here of using, using the, uh, the supply base that's out there. As you just mentioned, you have a multi-decade career sort of in this area that, to my understanding, really spans a lot of sort of different aspects of agriculture, manufacturing, engineering. As you mentioned, your degree is in chemical engineering, which right. all sounds really necessary to be able to create this sort of plan of how and to understand all these different pieces that go into making this possible. Can you, again, it's a multi-decade career, but in, in right. a couple minutes, sort of tell me the sure. key parts of that that got you to this place. What were sort of the big stepping stones that got you to here? Right. Yeah. So I my career spans uh, 38 years. Um, I would say probably 28 of those years was, was in uh, agricultural technology. Um, and 10 years was in, uh, I'll say, especially in fine organic chemicals, including uh, flavors, uh, aromas, uh, also some industrial and, and commodity chemicals. So I've seen a lot of different, uh, different industries, but, but mostly, mostly ag. Uh, worked for some leading multinational companies, including uh, Union Carbide, uh, Rome Polanc, a French entity, uh, Aventus, which was a French-German interest, and then finally uh, worked with Bayer Crop Science. So uh, it's been a, a, a great ride. I, I, I worked in the 70s and 80s when it uh, seems like we were launching active ingredients every year. It was a very prolific time for the industry and, you know, developing and building a lot of the industry workhorse, you know, molecules that, uh, you know, through the 80s, 90s and, and 2000s. So I've seen a lot, um, worked internationally, uh, worked in process development, engineering, uh, plant design, construction, manufacturing. I've been a, a plant manager. I uh, was director of active ingredient manufacturing for Rome Polanc uh, here in North America. And with Aventus and Bayer Crop Science, I was head of the North American supply chain. So uh, it's been a, a great year. I've learned a lot, uh, successes and failures. And, uh, you know, I've just been trying to share some of that with, with Harp and, and hopefully put together some of the some of the best practices that, that I've garnered along along my career. With that insight from, as you just mentioned, you know, successes and failures that you've seen over many years, what do you see as the biggest upcoming challenges to agricultural supply chains in general? And I know that's a big question, but I feel like it's yeah. something that, you know, from food prices going up to raw material costs going up. You know, I think it's right. something that even outside of the actual agricultural industry, people are starting to feel. Uh, what do you what do you sort of predict, you know, for the next five, 10 years of sort of supply chains in these fields? Well, it, you know, we're all aware of you know, the, the inflationary environment. Uh, costs have been spiraling so uh, a nimble, agile, uh, you know, technically efficient supply chain and, and, and technology, as far as that goes, is, is going to be really key uh, to, to managing costs uh, and and driving, you know, profitability, uh, not only for, for the farmer or grower, but, but you know, for, for, for HARP as, as well, or the manufacturer. So uh, efficiency is, is, is going to be key. Uh, costs have, have been a challenge. Um, and, and there's just, it's been such a, uh, you know, a, a disruptive world way, lately. And we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of the, the hazards of the ag supply chain from everything from single sourcing to, to one plant, you know, uh, serving, you know, the worldwide base of active ingredients. We've seen the, the pandemic, we've seen port strikes, we've seen embargoes, uh, you know, all, all the above. So there's so many things that can, can go wrong in the ag supply chain, particularly when you're working with very unique chemistry, single chain chemistry, often not a lot of alternatives for, for raw materials because they can be uh, sometimes specialized and complex themselves. So you can get real narrow if you don't, uh, if you don't design in flexibility and resiliency up, up front. And these are some of the problems, and and that uh, and this is what we're trying to address early on with Harp to create a technology platform that that is flexible, that lends itself to various manufacturing options and sourcing options, um, and not just be in, in one in one bucket and and uh, and hope that nothing nothing spills. 
So that's what we're trying to d- design in, bake in uh, uh, up front. And um, I'm just happy that we do have uh, s- some options here to consider, which is which is very unique uh, historically. I, I've not seen uh, as many supply chain options as, as I have for HARP as, and, and, and a dozen other active ingredient compounds that, that I've developed and, and commercialized in, in my career. So this is a this is a real luxury to have this uh, uh, called duality of supply. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, we have what that which nature gives us, and on the other hand. You know, we can we can mimic nature. We can you know through through these natural natural uh, nature identical ingredients that we're capable of, of of manufacturing through a supply base. So it gives us a lot of a lot of flexibility, the ability to pick and choose active compounds that that have unique uh, bioherbicidal properties. And are there any specific either advantages or challenges to one or the other? You know, if you're transporting giant tankers of mint oil, do you have to worry about it going bad faster than if you're synthesizing it at the plant sort of thing? Are there any sort of, you know, this resiliency built in, I think is so important from having both of these different options, but are there, yeah. are there specific things you're thinking about, about one chain or the other of like, Ooh, this is where this one could really excel. And this is where this one could really excel in different environments maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, so we'll have we'll be faced with the challenge of, of, of scaling up, you know, the natural mental supply chain. Um, uh, yes, that will be our task to get it into into tankers and scale on a global level. Um, and, and the industry is, is fully capable of doing that. Uh, the great thing is that it's uh, the compounds are, are stable. They have a, a, a nice shelf life uh, similar to the uh, nature identical uh, synthesized compounds. So. That's a, that's a nice problem. Um, often with other living organs, living organisms or biologicals, let's say soil, soil microbes, that's not always the case. I've, I've had some experience there where shelf life uh, stability is a problem, return of product, reassaying the product, uh, very tedious storage conditions, for example. So that's, that's not the, the biological world we'll be living in. We're, we're more with the fixed chemistry. Um, um, so that's, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, they're from a supply chain perspective, they'll be quite similar, uh, obviously one we're, we're cultivating and there's a whole, whole process there, uh, we'll have more uh, uncertainty about, uh, crop yields in any given year, but that's, that's typical of agriculture and we have to, to, uh, you know, plan accordingly. And of course the diversity of production will be helpful there, Northern sem- hemisphere, Southern hemisphere, India, U S there's, there's. Uh, opportunities there to, to manage, you know, that that possibility um, of yield, year uh, year to year yield variation. Um, so I hope hopefully I answered your question there. <laughs> no, I think you did. I think you answered it perfectly. That you know, one of the things that I think thinking about biologicals, it's always this fear of like it's got to stay alive, but like these do not. This does not these need to do stay not. alive. Exactly. You can pop it on the shelf and it's going to be just fine. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, you know, the thing that we have to be aware of, and I've had, I've had the experience of, of, you know, these, these nature identical compounds before also in the food and, and flavoring industry, I, I actually uh, developed and, and built and started up the, the world's largest vanilla plant. So synthetic vanilla. So on one hand we have, you know, natural vanilla, uh, produced in very select climates, uh, uh, like in Madagascar, for example, but there's simply not enough to go around the world and it's very expensive at that, but a huge need for lookalike or synthetic vanilla. And, um, you know, the, the thing we have to be aware of is that, you know, you, you don't have to uh, get too caught up in, in just in, in being 100% accurate in, in, in mimicking nature. I mean, nature's great. Nature works, but sometimes we, we get caught up being too precise with the chemistry and the process and, and we get kind of pigeonholed and, and detailed and, and, you know, the costs tend to blow up. And most of the time you'll, we'll find that, you know, my, my lesson learned was that, you know, just sometimes just doing 90 or 95% of what nature gives, if you can reproduce that, you know, that's going to be good enough for your application. And that that's especially the, the true in the case of, of a bioherbicide like 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 harp you know we're not trying to mimic nature and have again all the the finest organoleptic properties that mint has to offer the consumer you know we we've got a different 
purpose, a different end use, and we can be a little more crude, a little more industrial, um, you know, with with the supply and the specifications and, and the quality. And that bodes well for one for capacity, the ability uh, to to expand production, and, and also for for cost as well. So it's that cost versus quality trade off. I actually don't know if you can answer this this question for me or if it's proprietary at the moment, but I'm curious. Are the sort of natural similars and the lookalikes that you're looking at, are they being produced mostly through organic synthesis or are they being produced through like synthetic biology pathways? Yeah, it's it's exclusively through through organic synthesis. OK. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And, and uh, you know, there's uh, and, and again, as I said, there's there's um, uh, numerous uh, synthesis routes to make the same um, end uh, biochemicals. Um, and, and so that's what makes it very, very interesting. You can uh, actually pick and choose different starting materials and, and get to the same endpoint. Uh, at the same time, you know, we can have different, uh, potentially different supply sources uh, uh, and locations from uh, one or multiple manufacturers and not be uh, tied to uh, a certain you know, raw material. So uh, a lot of flexibility there. And that, that's important, you know, again, when we get back to the resiliency and redundancy and, and which you know, make, make for a good supply chain. So much of what you're talking about sounds like a big puzzle. It sounds like finding all of these pieces to make something that works and that functions and that's resilient and redundant. What's the most fun part of this for you? Well, I, I, you know, the, uh, the fun part for me, and it was the, uh, uh, my uh, initial attraction to harp is, uh, you know, I've been in, been in this industry a long time and, and seen uh, so many, you know, successes and, and failures. And, uh, you know, on one hand, I, I, I look at uh, a lot of the, the chemistry that was created in the seventies and eighties that, um, you know, that took me around the world and, and, you know, was the, the lifeblood of these companies for the nineties and two thousands. And now, you know, in the, the latter part of my career, in the last 10 years, I saw a lot of these um, technologies go by the wayside. You know, they became obsolete. Um, yes, you know, the regulatory bars have been getting higher in some cases, but in other cases, it's, it was the failure to, to life cycle manage and, and continuous improve these, these processes. You know, there, there wasn't that plan from inception on how, how we'll, we'll sustain this technology over time. And, and so it was kind of sad to watch, you know, a lot of your inventions and the plants you build and the people you employed, uh, you know, to see some of these these technologies go by the wayside. But HARP is is different. It, it's a, it, it's a wonderful uh, invention. Um, you know, it, it ticks so many boxes, interesting boxes for me. It's 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 low hazard. You know, it's got an excellent safety profile for humans and the environment. Um, it's, I would say, relatively straightforward to manufacture uh, chemically in the case of Nature Identical. And of course, it, it can be grown. It's fairly prolific in, in that respect. Um, it, you know, we're able to uh, build a, a, a unique and, and diverse and robust supply chain. We can play on this duality of, of supply to ensure that, you know, we, we won't have uh, disruptions in the future, we can kind of build in, build in this, this desired flexibility. And, and, and we've got, you know, what, what's impressive is that there's an existing supply base that is just super engaged with, with us as, as HARP right now, uh, helping us through uh, discovery and playing what if and looking at analogs of the chemistry already, already starting that life cycle management discussion and uh, just some great, uh, potential partners out there for the future. And it, it's such a unique place. So that's that's what's exciting to me. It, it, this sort of one-ups uh, basically everything I've done in, in, in my career, uh, even including that, that, that large uh, vanilla plant that I worked on for, for eight years. I mean, I don't know which, which is a nicer, I think, thing to sort of come home at the end of the day smelling like mint or vanilla. I mean... Yeah, that, that's 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 a hard choice. Uh, yeah. It really is. Uh, that and and I and I did come home uh, to the house <laughs> smelling like vanilla for a, <laughs> a, a lot of years, uh, for for sure. But and my car was was full of vanilla, <laughs> no doubt. 
It sounds like you have this all worked out, but I, I might as well ask, is there any sort of looming challenge that you're like, this is the thing that we got to figure out in the next year and we're going to do it. But like, that's the thing that you're like, ah, we just need yeah. that final key. Yeah. Well, you know, of course we're, we're starting at the beginning and it's the same challenge that, that all new discoveries and technology have, you know, you, 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 you know, um, you know, you're going to be successful and, and we've, we've got to, you know, build out and expand. That's, that's just a given. It's a, you know, a symptom of, 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 uh, of, of, of success. So uh, in, until you actually do that, you know, there, there's a bit of an insurity and these are all the, the, the things that we're, you know, we're looking at now. Um, but uh, as I said, we've got a, we've got a great uh, team of su- supply partners. There's, uh, there's, there's options and, and technical discussions to be had, but we're, we're starting from a, from a, a great point, but there's always that, you know, anxiety about, you know, doing it and knowing that you can doing it and taking those, those, those steps, but, uh, we, we know it'll come. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's top of mind, you know, right, right now, because we know harp's coming and, and we want to be, we want to be ready. That wraps up this episode of the harp bioherbicide podcast. Special thanks go out to Mike Cockrell. And of course, to our listeners. For more information on today's topic and Harp Bioherbicide's mission to provide a new environmentally safe and sustainable approach to weed control, you can visit harpbio.com. I'm Dr. Alex Danis, and we'll see you next time.